Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the double-edged double bill. This week, Wes Craven introduces us to his deadly friend under the stairs. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between one and ten in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. And I am Adam Thomas, and I really tried to think of a funny line to use from our good movie, and all of it just is problematic, so I don't want to use it. And I am Thomas Mariani, and uh, I am your deadly friend to the end, BB. Yeah. All right, well, I mean, you just got to do Donald Duck voices, basically. <laughs> and then some early Roger Rabbit voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. Bit. We'll we'll get into that. But uh, we have a guest with us, Adam. Um, she is a writer and an assistant editor over places like Talk Film Societies, where she's the assistant editor, but she also writes for places like Film Cred. Uh, and she's uh, very enthusiastic here. It's Miss Erin Brady. Erin, welcome to the show. Uh, beep, beep. <laughs> Perfect. We programmed you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really awesome to be here, guys. I'm really happy to finally be on here now and to talk about some interesting Wes Craven films. Before we even get to Wes Craven, Aaron, I apologize, we have a big announcement for the show in general we have to uh, go ahead and tell everybody about. Um, everybody, uh, you might have missed some things that were at the beginning of the show. We used to have like the ESO bumpers and all that other stuff. Uh, that has changed because uh, we are now a part of of Talk Film Society. Uh, we are part of the podcast network for Talk Film Society. Uh, our friend of the show, Marcelo Pico, has been on a couple times, and that's his network. And we decided, you know, let's move over to his uh, network. Let's leech off of his internet podcast fame. And we want to keep in mind that with that, there's no ill will toward our former network ESO, Mike Faber and Gordon, everybody else over there. They're still great. Please continue to support them if you uh, feel so kind to, although that means some things are gone, like the intro and the there will be no more ad in the middle of the show. And of course, the uh, merchandise that we used to sell over there that will not be in the store any longer, probably by the time uh, you all are listening to this, it's posted up. Uh, but we wish them all the best. And uh, we are very excited to join the Talk Film Society family, aren't we, Adam? Hey, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I was no, going to say that didn't sound enthusiastic at all. <laughs> <laughs> I roped him into this. I dragged him into doing this. 100%. No, yeah, no, I'm, I agree with you 100%. No ill will toward DSO. They were great. Uh, really understanding, really kind of just let us do our own thing. Uh, but, you know, we just sort of universally decided that we feel Talk Film Society is going to be a sort of a better showcase for our particular show, and we, we might fit in better here. Uh, so that, that's really the main reason behind the, behind the jump. Nothing else. Yes. If you're new to us and you're on the Talk Film Society uh, channel, welcome, um, if you're a listener, over to that main feed. Uh, keep in mind that this is episode 191 of the show, so we've been doing this for quite a while. We're coming up on our four-year anniversary uh, in a couple months. Um, but the, the thing is, uh, there's a huge backlog then of stuff you can listen to. Um, that'll be available on our Podbean main feed, which should be a link in the description for that, uh, here. We definitely recommend digging into that archive and downloading whatever episodes you would like, uh, of that. But, uh, starting from 191 onward, uh, we'll be posting them on Talk Film Society as well. So it'll be a lot of fun here, talking uh, film in a very film-appropriate place with a bunch of other uh, film lovers like Aaron, of course, who uh, we're, we're a part of the same family unit now. Aaron, isn't that great? Mm-hmm. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds just as enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> just, just like a random step-uncle you meet at like a family reunion now, just like, who the fuck is this? Who's my Aunt Mary? What is this? <laughs> God. <laughs> you know, the problem is, is that there's that type of person at every single like family get together or reunion. Oh, I sure. There would always be one new 
guy there and he was always way too enthusiastic to meet the rest of the extended family i don't know if that's like a universal thing but i'm considered thomas to be just that perpetual new guy at every family reunion i mean that in the nicest way i can well i appreciate that much i know it's kind of like they're it's the same group as like the people who you know are a part of your family because your closer family has told you they're a part of that and you probably saw them when you were like six and then you meet Mm -hmm. up with them again just like oh yeah you yeah i remember you it's like the same group of just like sure right whatever and i'm the uncle's buddy that came with them for some reason (laughs) <laughs> like, like that's no ties to the family whatsoever. I heard there was going to be shrimp. There's shrimps. You're like you're like the slime to Thomas's <laughs> Paul. Oh, <laughs> oh, all right. I'll take it. <laughs> we'll we'll take what we can get. But yes, uh, thank you to Talk Film Society for accepting us, and uh, we hope to uh, gain some new listeners and uh, hopefully have some other people who are part of the network guest on uh, besides Marcelo. It'll be fun uh, as we continue this uh, journey with them. But let's get to the topic of the evening, which uh, we're doing because of uh, Scream, the new Scream, that for some reason is called Scream, even though it should be, as we affectionately call it, Adam, Five Cream. Yep, it's Five Cream. Do you accept this title as well, Aaron, of Five Cream, (laughs) given Scraforum was the last one? (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, the number five, it would fit perfectly within, uh, within that title. Who cares if it'd be called something stupid like five cream because i personally think that's a lot more creative than scream i understand what they're going for but i still think they could have done just a little bit more creative yeah and i agree with you thomas if the previous one was called scraforum like you you gotta just go with it at this point like you don't dive in that head first and then just abandon it like, no, man. If you don't want to do that, then I'm cool with you doing some kind of subtitle or whatever the hell. Like, that used to be the problem with sequels. Just like, oh, like, you know, Matrix Resurrections just came out recently. And some people would say, oh, I scoff at that title. I prefer that vastly to just titling it the same title as the first movie. Yes. To kind Absolutely. of like disguise the idea that it's a remake or not. Like, Halloween ruined that. The new Halloween. The third mm-hmm. Halloween movie called Halloween. I don't know. It's ridiculous. But... Uh, you know, we mentioned Scraforum, and that was uh, the last film on that franchise, but also the last film for master director Wes Craven, uh, who was beloved in the horror genre. And we've been wanting to do an episode on him for quite a bit, uh, as we are wont to do, where we cover, you know, a good and a bad pick related to a topic, as we usually do on the show here for any of you new people. Um, with Wes Craven, we've wanted to do him for a while. We had him as a Patreon topic choice and all sorts of other stuff. And we just figured this is probably the most appropriate time, given we're not going to do a, a Radio Silence episode, the people who are directing the new one, because they don't have mm-hmm. extensive enough filmography. But yeah, we figured, you know, even though it's been a few years since uh, Mr. Craven passed, he's very worthy of doing a topic on, right, Adam? Fuck yeah. That's my level of excitement. But yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the modern masters, for sure. Aaron, I'm curious, I know you're generally a horror fan, but what are your general opinions on Wes Craven, you know, as a, as a director, his style, his filmography? How do you feel about him? He is definitely one of not only my favorite directors, but overall in his structure and directing style. I like to think he is a good inspiration for my creative process as a whole, just because I think he has such a good idea of pacing and tension where it's like some really good information and then a scary scene and then some other important information and then another scary scene. It's all feels really natural. His movies, even ones that are a little bit more questionable, they're all extremely cohesive and kinetic. Would that be the right word? Because it all just flies by especially for horror and especially for the type of horror that he was most known for, like the slasher, that is the absolute best pacing that you could possibly do. I've respected him since I was a teenager. I named my dog after him. I don't know how uh, weird that is, but I was just, I remember, okay. I know I promised that I wouldn't talk about my dog on this, but <laughs> it's now, now a dog I, cast. We've changed it completely. Now that we're on Talk Film Society, it's all about dogs. Yes. But I remember I adopted him and I wasn't sure what to name him. 
But for some reason, when I was just looking at him, he was just resting on my lap in the car. All I could think of for some reason was Wes Craven. How many other uh, Wes Craven fans can say that they've named a dog after him? I mean, maybe not after him. I'm sure there are dozens named Freddy. Or like mine, David O. Russell and Fellini. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, I get that because I think Craven kind of has that sensibility. That, that it's interesting because I remember when I was younger, I was like so scared by even the idea, even before I saw any of his movies of like, oh, the Scream or Nightmare on Elm Street, they're so scared, they're so terrifying. And even when I watched those movies, I thought they were scared. It's like, who's the sicko that made these up? And then you <laughs> watch, watch interviews with that dude, and he was so genteel and sweet and very kind in the way that like a lot of those horror filmmakers tend to be. He kind of... I put him in a similar camp with, like, a Sam Raimi, where he's like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, who's this sick fuck? He's just, like, some Midwestern dude who's like, hi, hello. Yeah, you? you know, it's it's funny. Robert England said it kind of perfect when he was going in to read for Nightmare on Elm Street. He's like, I was going to go and read for it. And it's the guy who made, like, Last House on Left and Hills Have Eyes. He's like, I walked in expecting the Prince of Darkness. And there's tall, erudite, preppy Ralph Lord Wes Craven, just about as friendly as you could be and offered me tea. <laughs> it's like, it just blew his mind. Absolutely, dude. It, it's just, it goes to show that everybody's got a dark side, man. Right. Though I think that also helps that, like, before he even was a filmmaker, which was interesting, where he first started getting into film as, like, an editor and writer for porn movies, like, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, But even before that, he was, like, training to be a minister when he was younger, and he was an academic briefly. He taught, like, English, I believe, before he even went into the film industry to any degree. And he didn't direct, at least Last House, I believe, until he was, like, in his late 20s, early 30s. So yeah. it feels like there was kind of like a maturity to him that really, especially as his movies kind of went on from there, it felt like he was pretty all together in terms of all of his darkness and all of his quiet genteelness at the same time. I think that's really key to him being like as interesting a filmmaker as he was because he had was a bit more together as a person by the time he started making movies. Yeah, and I think that the idea of catharsis in a way I feel like that is a running theme throughout a lot of his movies because I wasn't necessarily raised to be like repressed or anything like that. But even before I started like really going into the directors whose movies I liked, I've always kind of noticed with Wes Craven stuff is that, and this kind of goes back to its pacing, how he paces his films. Um, he, in those quieter moments, they almost seem a little bit too quiet. And that makes the scares even that more like frightening or thrilling because there's the tension just keeps building and building up. I can't help but think that kind of represents how as he started getting older and has as he started like exploring the world a little bit more, I can't help but think that maybe that that influenced it because of course you don't go from Uh, being trained as a minister to making porn like overnight that's a gradual thing and so um the idea of catharsis and repression you can definitely see it throughout his films yeah i mean in case you couldn't tell from any of his movies uh he might have a problem with religion that maybe came from his (laughs) issue in case you couldn't tell from any one of his movies as at least one religious piece of shit person (laughs) who knows Mm -hmm. maybe maybe he has a problem he's not necessarily the most subtle guy but even like when he was doing some of his worst movies we're gonna be talking about a bad movie of his um at the very least they all distinctly feel like Wes Craven I would say even at his worst um because there's so much ambition and also this weird mix of like a genuine care about the characters and the plot that's going on and, like, a real earnest investment in it, while at the same time, he liked doing silly bullshit. (laughs) And that's kind of the charm. Even when you get to, like, scream, as later as that was in his career, it's that great mix of, like, oh, there's all this interest in, like, the metacontextual stuff and the trauma of Sidney Prescott, but also Ghostface fucking falls around a lot. It's slapstick bullshit at the same time. (laughs) There's, There's a real balance that I really like, and even his worst movies, you can tell that's there. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's go ahead and go into our uh, what we're going to be doing here. We'll be talking about two movies tonight. Uh, the first one will be our good pick, which was Adam's Choice. We picked these movies at the end of our last episode, if you're new. Um, Adam picked The People Under the Stairs as one of his choices for the good pick. And then my bad pick is uh, his film Deadly Friend, which we'll talk extensively about both of those as we go along here. 
Uh, but let's go ahead and start off with the people under the stairs. In every neighborhood, there is one house that adults whisper about and children cross the street to avoid. Now, Wes Craven, creator of A Nightmare on Elm Street, takes you inside. Something's in there. We gotta get out of here, Leroy. All sorts of rumors about what goes on in that house. The police never took it serious. She's been feeding that thing between the walls again. Very, very tense about this. What goes on in this house is a sin. But what goes on under the stairs is a nightmare. Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. So The People Under the Stairs came out uh, November 1st, uh, 1991 from writer-director Wes Craven. And uh, was interesting because this is part of sort of his uh, post-Nightmare on Elm Street uh, kind of like bigger resurgence as a director where we'll, we'll talk about both these movies are post-Nightmare on Elm Street. But uh, with this one specifically, this is a bigger budgeted one, even though it's $6 million, it's still pretty big for Craven. Um, and it's a bigger universal movie that he had apparently a lot more free reign on than he would usually even get uh, for some of his movies. And um, it's an interesting little story. Adam, why don't you go ahead and if maybe people aren't aware of people under the series, why don't you give them a brief plot synopsis and go into your initial thoughts as to why you decided to pick this one? All right. Uh, to get as brief on the plot synopsis as I can, uh, the movie follows this young boy, uh, Poindexter, or Fool, which is like the the most really mean nickname like I've ever heard. You know what I mean? Like it's really mean. You okay, Fool? Like fuck you, dude. But anyways, um, so it follows him. Him and his mother and sister live in a really run down building you get the idea that it's sort of like in the projects or the ghetto of whatever area they're in and they have landlords who are jacking up the prices to move everybody out so they could tear down their buildings and build like office you know complexes things like that well the sister's boyfriend played by ving rings with hair keep that in mind uh talks him into going to rob the landlords uh so they can pay for his mother's medical procedure because turns out she has cancer and also so they can pay the rent and things like that so they go to the house they case the joint then they break in and basically insane shenanigans happen from there um i don't want to well, I guess if it's called the people under stairs, so guess what? There's people under the stairs. Whoa! Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was not prepared for this. Fuck it, threw me for a loop. So it turns out the landlords have a bunch of sort of deformed kids that they've personally uh, sort of harmed and cut, blinded, and things like that uh, that they've stolen from the neighborhood forever, uh, living under their stairs, and they uh, may or may not. Uh, also inbred but uh, that's about as far as I'm willing to go with it and uh, I picked it because this is my favorite Wes Craven movie hot take I don't care I love this movie I think it when I first saw it it scared the pants off of me now I just think it is fucking just so fun to watch in a very macabre disturbing way but it is so over the top with its slapsticky and sort of Everett McGill is going full on like just goofy gummy man in this movie with his movements and his facial expressions and it's just really strong performance from kid actors and margot roby gives a real good mommy dearest wendy, perf- wendy roby not not, not margot no it's margot no no, no that's how long she's <laughs> wow been very early like, like 30 years she's aged wonderfully <laughs> she, she's got benjamin button um but uh yeah, no, it's it's just, it's fucking great, dude. I, I love this movie. I think it's funny. I think it's scary. I think it's a great set. I love the costume design. I love everything about it. I just think it's it's just a, such a weird black comedy gem. Well, yeah, that's, that's that's very interesting. We'll definitely get into more of your thoughts as we go along. But I'm curious, Aaron, what about you? Do you enjoy People Under the Stairs? Would you say it's one of your favorite Cravens or your favorite? It's definitely up there. I'm not, I'm still not entirely sure what my favorite Craven is, but but as someone who has like had the experience of feeling like you, they're kind of getting forced out of your place because like so much, so many like richer people are coming in, it definitely does hit 
a chord for me. And I not necessarily in like a super emotional way, but I do think the satire is very both on the nose and also perfect because even though mommy and daddy seem like caricatures, I can assure you that outside of the child kidnapping and potential inbreeding, all landlords are like this. I cannot express this enough. (laughs) I think that this film is just a really effective satire. It's definitely no surprise that a very influential horror filmmaker of the past couple of years has been largely influenced by this film. Yeah, I, I I can definitely agree with that. I would say it is at least in my top five Cravens. I wouldn't go as far mm-hmm. to say it's my favorite, but I, I do agree that I think it's definitely, you know, satire that some might accuse of being a bit too blunt. But at the same time, I think Craven tends to deal with like a lack of subtlety necessarily. Whatever subtlety is in a Craven movie is more individual character stuff. Uh, as opposed to like the broader themes are not subtle here when like the first scene we have is with our, our main character fool as played by Brandon Adams um, is, you know, living impoverished and his family is in de- sort of a destitute state as Adam mentioned and everything seems pretty bad for him. And the immediate cut to <laughs> Everett McGill chowing down on like a Flintstones level rack of ribs <laughs> in his very nice looking living room <laughs> immediately just is like, no, we're not going to be subtle about any of this, but it still is effective satire at the same time because we're dealing with a very broad horror comedy as Adam kind of mentioned. Like these characters are very big and the performances are just as big with a lot of them. But at the same time, they're dealing with themes that are very universal. I mean, it's also just interesting given, obviously, Wes Craven was a white man, so he wasn't necessarily arguably the best person to depict this particular situation. But at the same time, he was a guy who had at least the power to make a movie like this. Whereas, like, this is the same year as, like, John Singleton was scraping by to make Boys in the Hood. So black filmmakers didn't have as much opportunity to do something like this. So Craven was like, well, I feel like I would at least want to get some kind of social satire out there with my privilege that I have and at least try something. And even if some of the stuff might be a bit distant date, at least the fact that it's as broad as it is, I think helps the fact that he's not maybe the most experienced person. No. Yeah, I definitely agree. That's where it gets his biggest level of charm for me is he is definitely trying to get forth a message. And I, and I do feel that he knows he's not necessarily the best person to get it across, but he is probably, like you said, at the time, he has the ability to where a lot of African-American or black filmmakers weren't able to tell, you know, the stories they wanted to tell. And, uh, and you could tell, like, even with some of the things that might be a little too heavy or he might not really have the best perspective on, I feel like that's when he really goes for it and goes crazy. Cause he's like, well, there we go. <laughs> like, you know? Right. And it probably helps also that our main, you know, sort of protagonist is this young black boy who at the very least feels like he's constantly like, I'm not like making fun of this kid or his situation or looking down him to any degree. The, Brandon Adams was like in a couple other uh, like movies. He was like the one black kid in Sandlot and some other things like that. But I like the fact that his performance really denotes like he has an actual intellect to him. He's a very smart, perceptive kid, even more so than like a Ving Rhames with like, I just love Ving Rhames is going into this place that is immediately terrifying and spooky and not a good place yeah, to go into. get the fuck out! What are <laughs> you doing? And, and that's what Brandon Adams is doing the whole time. She's like, look, I don't know if we should do this. This seems really scary. He has much better instincts than he doesn't. He's like, what, seven, I think? Yeah, seven or eight. And I, you know, Real quick, I love that that dog just terrorizes Bing Rams. Like, I mean, that dog is all over Bing Rams. Yet, Fool is the one who's like, your mother slept with cats. And the dog's like, you motherfucker. And goes after him. <laughs> and then Fool just straight up, like, uppercut jabs the dog in the face at one point. And the dog's like, and runs away. I'm like, yeah, this kid's got it together. We're dumbass Bing Rams. Like, I'm a hide behind a couch. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiot. And then immediately when he, like, tries to look up over the couch, of course that's when the dog is going to, like, charge at him. Because... He, he pokes his head over the couch like, is he God? <laughs> you fucking moron. You waited five seconds. <laughs> like... I don't know the name of that dog actor, but that dog actor. Prince, so man. Well, it was Prince in the movie. Prince is his character. I'm not going to, I don't know if that's his real name. It's not like a Toto situation where he changes his name to Prince after that. Now it's a symbol. That's his name. Well, that's true. Yes, now it's a symbol. The, the artist formerly known as Prince. Prince yes. Yeah. yes. 
Uh, but Aaron, how do you feel the movie kind of juggles some of these like broader things with the social satire in general? It knows exactly what it is. I would kind of like to think of this as a, not necessarily a test run to scream, but because that was definitely new nightmare. This was around maybe around the time when he started thinking about um, what it what is commonplace in society, not just in entertainment, but just as society as a whole. And what I think that's pretty interesting is that the fairly similar but far more straightforward Candyman that came out a year after People Under the Stairs, mm. and I honestly think that those these two movies could be a really good double feature in that sense because they essentially tell like some very similar stories but they do so in vastly different ways because both stories are about gentrification and how how rooted in racism so many policies um within not only the housing system but in tons of other systems controlling our society nowadays they tell very similar things about the dangers of letting racism and capitalism go amok in the people under the stairs case they do it by portraying these wild outlandish characters anchored by fool who just seems very tired and just a little bit like of course he's scared but he also seems very annoyed throughout the movie which I really appreciate that's why I love him whereas Candyman it tells it in a more straightforward and like horror-esque way well yeah especially because like Candyman does it in much more like this is a huge gothic story that we're telling with a lot of like Mm -hmm. uh, backstory to it a lot more myth as opposed to this movie is like a myth in the same way of, like, a campfire story. Like, they both, like, mm-hmm. had that same kind of thing of, like, it's a neighborhood legend in this case of, like, oh, you don't want to go up to that house. Like, Bill Cobbs later shows up, and he even has basically that same thing. Like, no one went up to that house. Everyone's aware, like, they used to run the funeral parlor, and now they're, like, weird incest siblings, basically. <laughs> Whereas, like, Bernard Rose's Candyman, that feels a lot more kind of, like, gothic in the way of, like, a Clive Barker story, as we've talked about on that show ages ago. We talked about that movie. Versus uh, this is much more of, like, the campfire story that you get told and you're like, is this actually real? In this case, um, I guess every single detail you would embellish, like as a kid, is true. Of just like, yep, they had a gimp suit and they had little shoots that they could make out of the stairs and all those other <laughs> shit. It feels like it has that kind of energy. It feels almost like, interestingly, because around the same time was the start of Halloween Horror Nights over Universal. Mm-hmm. And they actually did a couple years, uh, half based on this over there. It has that same energy of walking through one of those mazes at Halloween Horror Nights where you're just like, every corner has a weird detail and it's telling you a story, but at the same time, it's just like bug nuts crazy shit is flying at the screen at you. So it's as entertaining as it is like insightful. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but Adam, I guess go into a bit more detail of like, why do you prefer this one over say like some of the heavy hitters like Scream or Nightmare on Elm Street? Why is this one really tap into what you love about Craven the most? Uh, like, kind of how you alluded to earlier. Well, uh, both of you really did. But just sort of the kinetic energy he, he just throws into it. I mean, there are so many scenes and just of Everett McGill and Wendy Roby, uh, formerly Margot, uh, just hamming it up, man. I mean, just going full bore for it. You know, like, oh, God, I mean, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. He's dancing around her in the hall and shit. One of my favorite scenes ever is when he looks through the bathroom door and then looks up and he's got that oh, face on before he gets hit with the toilet tank lid. I mean, it's just, there's so much just crazy shit happening in this movie all the time. Once he gets that gimp suit on, it like kind of doesn't let up for the rest of the movie. And even when he's not in the gimp suit, like when the cops come and he looks like he just got back from a fishing trip at like 1030 at night. Like you're like, this is the silliest thing I've ever seen. But it's just, it's so silly and so kinetic and so crazy, but it's anchored by just genuine moments of terror and horror. Like you got Everett McGill in the gimp suit running around with a shotgun trying to get him, letting prints in the walls, you know, kill him! And then her bathing the daughter in a boiling hot bath. 
And you're like, oh my God, this is so disturbing. Then you get back to the silly stuff. Like, hey, oh fuck, here we go again. Like it's just it's it's got such a weird balance to it that just really kind of keeps me glued the entire time. I laugh at this movie. I'm generally disturbed by this movie. Honestly, Everett McGill and uh Wendy Roby formerly Margot just give two of the best performances to me in almost any of his movies. They're so fun and disturbing and crazy and over the top. Like you see why he took them as a package deal from Twin Peaks and things like that. Like they're just great in this movie. Yeah, when you make uh, Big Ed and Nadine look like a more stable couple. Yeah. You know, big problems. <laughs> as a yeah, you did your work. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't even talked about it as much. Like, you mentioned the daughter, uh, AJ Langer, um, who is, it's a weird thing where she's like 17 playing 12. Uh, but she has that kind of like mousy appearance where even she doesn't have to be actually 12. She just looks like somebody who has been like so coddled and so like put into this particular place by these two crazy people it's just like nope that's that's what you are you are an innocent 12 year old that's all you'll ever be kind of thing that re- like really unsettles you even there and then you see the people under the stairs who are genuinely upsetting but at the same time craven treats them less like actual monsters it's like initially they look like monsters and then you get to know especially like sean whalen who is so great um as roach uh just popping up with like the tongue and everything you get a full sense of like oh i love roach uh, as a like a fun character when i get to know him and i feel bummed when he dies it's a shame and especially with like a a total lack of dialogue because of his tongue and everything it's it's a real testament to how craven really liked the sort of people who might have felt outcast and wanted to give them a bit of a spotlight Do, do you think that really works for you and aaron with like some of the actual people under the stairs is like horror movie monsters you can sympathize with. I do think that horror as a whole kind of does have a monster problem that veers very much onto ableism. But I do think that I'm um although like some of the appearances of the people under the stairs definitely are like upsetting, it's also understandable and you can't really think of them as monsters once you understand the context of why they are the way they are it's because the couple that kidnapped them and tortured them and made them like go to the brink of insanity maybe most of them have even crossed that line you just you feel bad for them and i think that sort of sympathy and care even if it's for like a fleeting moment, that is one of the things that Wes Craven does best. Because even with like the ghost face killer, so to say, you can't really hate them because all of them have like varying degrees of reason reasons for why they're doing what they're doing. Like for example, um, Mrs. Loomis, she was just so upset about her son. And although she didn't exactly do things in the most ethical of ways, honestly, um, you still have that little bit of sympathy for her because she was just driven to the brink. And I think that the same can definitely go for the people under the stairs because they didn't ask to be the way they are. They didn't ask to be kidnapped and tortured and brutalized to the point where they have to eat each other to survive. They're not like actively trying to hurt fool. We previously talked about Wes Craven not necessarily being subtle, but it's definitely one of those things where the real monsters are among us and the people we think are monsters really aren't. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about the ending of this movie in particular, when like the people actually get up from under the stairs. It makes Mm -hmm. this moment that like has a lot of hallmarks of like zombie movies and all this other stuff, like the people getting swarmed, a triumphant moment. Yeah, fuck them. Fuck Mm -hmm. (laughs) these two who have that appearance of normalcy that I I like noticeably that Craven tends to have them have this like much more traditional sort of like, oh, suburban household couple vibe whenever the cops are around. That feels just like, oh, we're very traditional, very old school. Like we're trying to appeal to like a 50s era sensibility of just like, oh, we're great and we're calm. We're two just trustworthy white folks, right? We couldn't be doing anything terrible. And it's just hiding literally so much in their basement closet of just like bodies and all this other stuff that I agree with what Adam said earlier. It feels so ghoulish and nightmarish, but at the same time, it's like really doing that for a really interesting different purpose that you wouldn't even get as much 
in horror, horror films at this time. And it really just displays so much of why Craven did, had such a phenomenal perception of the idea. It's just like, oh, hey, anybody who seems like they're so normal, despite the fact that they're clearly taking away from a class system, um, is totally just ha- hiding both all of their money of like these poorer people and bodies literally underneath their floorboards. It's so great all the way down to as silly as it is just that huge explosion that happens at the end and the different <laughs> angles. It's just like big edge just like goes zooming across the basement, all this other stuff. It's so satisfying to see at the same time. It is literally just like, Oh, they've been like Scrooge McDucking down here. And then all their money just gets blown out of the chimney to all the like poor people outside. Once again, it's hitting you over the head, but in a way that still really fits perfectly for the tone of the movie. Yeah, you feel so happy for these kids because they're finally free of the hell that they've been put through under mommy and daddy. And so even if it is like kind of goofy and silly, the way that it happens, you just can't help but be happy for them. Yeah, over the rap song that plays. It's great. It's the perfect <laughs> 90s ending. <laughs> well, I mean, I am happy for them, but at the same time, you're like, oh, man, they should probably take some of that money because they're fucked. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> like, man, those people were so distracted because of that house because those fuckers just walked out amongst them. <laughs> no, like nobody. Nope. And, yeah, I mean, not of what? And you got to figure there's like probably 20 to 25 of these fuckers. Some of them wearing leather masks and like weird, like red sweatshirts and all. And yeah, they're just gone. And, and you know, the other rap song, you know, it's the people under the stairs <laughs> or whatever it is, which I wish it was. But <laughs> <laughs> we even joked about that it should have been like a Will Smith style, just like rap about the plot of the movie. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> under the stairs, so scary down there. Um, but um, you know, yeah. But then it's like you think about like two days after that happens, what's gonna happen to those poor fucks? I, I do also like the fact that Craven doesn't necessarily say like, "Oh, this solves like the capitalistic grind against poor classes." At the same time, I think that's inherent, like even by the end of the story, where it's a fun, triumphant moment. But there is still, like, all the people under the stairs are leaving and all this other stuff. I, I kind of like the idea that it doesn't necessarily solve the societal problem. It just solves it for, like, this neighborhood temporarily. But, but yeah, I think there's there's a lot there. But we have a whole other movie to talk about. And, boy, we're going to talk about it extensively. So let's do some quick final thoughts on the people under the stairs. Uh, Aaron, your final thoughts. I really enjoy it. I think it is one of the best movies that Wes Craven made in his lifetime. I know that it is fairly popular in like a good amount of horror circles, but I do hope that it gets the resurgence that it deserves because I definitely think as we're now in 2022 and we have not exactly been treated the most the kindest by our by the systems that we have in place here in the United States um I do think that it could resonate with a lot of people and so hopefully that resurgence of the people under the stairs comes sooner rather than later right yeah especially since you kind of hinted at this earlier we're going to be getting a Jordan Peele produced remake soon uh from his Monkey Paw Productions uh arm at Universal which I'm curious about nothing else because like that that dude I think uh, he he said as much as he like was really inspired by that original movie, and so mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a really big thing is that you know we talked about how you know black filmmakers at the time didn't get a chance to be able to make a story like this, and you can tell it like this clearly inspired because has that similar kind of tonal thing that like uh, you would later see in like especially in Us or Get Out mm-hmm. uh, in his movie. So I'm curious to see what he kind of helps to do with that particular new version. But uh, Adam, final thoughts. Uh, you know, I, to be brief, I said it before, this is my favorite uh, of Wes Craven's movies. I think it sort of fits pitch perfect into the really dark comedy horror mold. I love the performances. I love the set design. I love the costume design. I, I kind of love everything about it. I, I'm on board for the Jordan Peele sort of produced remake. I, I think if there's anybody out there who's going to do it, I, I prefer that it be him. A, because he seems to have sort of the, the right mindset to it. And yeah, he's influenced by it, but also he's kind of a name, so it'll draw more attention to it. And also perhaps to the original at the same time. I do hope maybe he also helps write or also direct the film itself, just because with his horror background, but also his comedic background as well, even though the like the satire and the comedy was very good in this, 
I'm not entirely sure how people would enjoy like the absurdity of it. So hopefully can maybe update that for a more modern, more ironic audience. So what we're saying is, Jordan, if you're listening, I'm sure you are, uh, get Keegan to play the Ving Rhames role. He'll be perfect. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Come on, reunite. You got to do it. Uh, but I mean, I, I agree with what everyone said here. I'll just add that, like, I, it's a real testament to the fact that Craven wasn't just the Nightmare on Elm Street or Scream guy. Um, a movie like this just shows the fact that, like, oh, he contained multitudes, even though this is in the horror genre. It is so buck nuts different than, like, either of those movies. Uh, whereas one, like, Nightmare on Elm Street is a lot more surreal, and uh, you got Scream that's a bit more grounded. You have this movie that takes place ostensibly in a reality that we're familiar with, with some of the satire it's talking about, but is so bug nuts and weird in a completely different way <laughs> than a lot of, like, you know, the more mainstream, successful Wes Craven movies uh, kind of tended to be. Uh, so yeah, I think it's great. I think it is one of his better movies. Uh, but it's time we got to one that maybe isn't as well known or as maybe consistent as people under the stairs with uh, his 1986 film, Deadly Friend. Who is it? If you enjoy Who's there? being really scared, if you're not afraid <gasps> of the unknown, if you found a friend uh-huh. in fear... And we have a friend for you. Hi. Samantha. Get me the police. The director who unleashed Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street, Wes Craven, now brings you his most frightening creation. <laughs> You're so cute. Deadly friend. She can't live without you. So, uh, Deadly Friend came out October 10th, 1986. uh, And Craven directed this, but he didn't write it because it was written by uh, Bruce Joel Rubin uh, based on the book Friend by uh, Diana Henstel. And uh, this is an interesting little gem I picked out. When doing, like, a bad Wes Craven movie, I think there are a lot of them that kind of have a weird mixed quality to them. But I think no film more displays the multitudes of Craven for good and bad than Deadly Friend. Because if you're not aware of this movie, you probably are aware at least of a clip from this movie. Because I think the first time I was ever even aware of this was there's a clip that's been going viral for, like, even pre-YouTube days of that I saw when I was younger of the Anne Ramsey character from this movie. Anne Ramsey, who you would recognize from, like, Goonies, throw on from the train, the sort of, like, older lady who had the smoky voice, um, getting murdered by a basketball, uh, which is kind of like the set piece infamous thing of this movie. And I'd seen that ages ago. I'm like, what the hell is this movie? And I can safely say, and I think Aaron and Adam maybe agree with me on this, even in context, uh... That still doesn't quite fit. <laughs> really? <laughs> right? uh, look, I I have to admit, this was a blind spot for me in Wes Craven's filmography. And I knew about, like, his incest porn movie he made. Mm-hmm. Um, but imagine my surprise when I loaded up this movie, because I, I had just rent, rented it on iTunes, and I realized it was sort of kind of about a robot because i was not expecting that at all no there's not you can't really anticipate deadly friend i'm so glad you didn't know anything about this because i when i saw this even the first time i was also not aware that like basically the plot of this movie is it starts off with this uh family which consists of a single mom and her son are moving into a you know suburban neighborhood and instead of having you know like a dog or a cat or a little sister they have a robot that the kid has programmed called bb this little yellow robot that has such little. advanced artificial <laughs> that's true i'm sorry yes he's little oh, he's, <laughs> that thing was a... massive that's true. What are yes, you talking a... <laughs> about? <laughs> okay, so it's a pretty big robot. Yes, it's the it's a bit short, but it's very stout. Uh, BB thick, as they say. Um, and oh. BB is uh, this robot that has such advanced artificial intelligence that I just love how casual all of the 
people in the neighborhood are when they meet BB. <laughs> of just like the, the most you get is a bit of like, a, oh, that's neat. You have a robot. That's cool. I wouldn't have anticipated that. Even though he's just like, yeah, he learns on his own and he's very intelligent, capable. Just like, you know, any reasonable person would be like, kid, you're like a god. You've created like a living being <laughs> that learns things out of machinery. <laughs> For 1986, especially, when this movie came out, that's astonishing. Yeah, my favorite sort of part with that is when he first meets his buddy, and he's like, you know, oh, that's cool robot. Did you move the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah. So you're going to go, we might go to school together. you in 10th grade? Uh, no, I'm going to actually science. Whatever. Like, that's what he's mad about. <laughs> he's not, that's the part that he's like, fuck you. When really, you should be like, oh, yeah, you really should be. You created sentient life. <laughs> sweet okay okay i have this has been something that i have just been anticipating for ever since i watched it i we really need to talk about the tension between those two friends right what? there was so much homoeroticism between those two dudes i really thought that it was going to turn into something like a little little kiss on the lips good night or like the homies do I like to think <laughs> that maybe they were the basis for uh, Billy and Stu, but I can't confirm or deny that. This may be the I first do. example of something that has no Rule 34 fan fiction out there. <laughs> Rule 34 <laughs> does not apply to this movie, <laughs> but maybe. I, I, mean, I can kind of see that, especially like, as the movie goes along and, you know, uh, the, we should say the main character is uh, Paul... Um, played by Matthew Lambertrucks, and uh, there's it's clearly the, a high school age student. A hundred percent, yes, clearly. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. Michael Sh- Michael Sherrod, who plays Tom Toomey. Like by the as he, you know, Tom finds out more about Paul. I just love how much betrayal is in his like voice, which is like, I can't believe you've done this, man. <laughs> we were supposed to be tight. We we're gonna run away together, and look what you've done. Okay. We have to keep going further because this is insane. Because I just love that this movie starts off with this, like a weird short circuit movie. And goes way weirder from there, where like uh, uh, Paul ends up uh, getting a, having a bit of like a flirtation with Samantha, the girl next door, played by Christy Swanson, who um, it turns out has an abusive father, and there's some tension that goes on there to the point where uh, she is killed about halfway through the movie, and Paul is just like, oh my god, I can't believe this, I lost her, and also I recently lost BB in a horrible accident. Uh, that's also hysterical um and he's like you know what um i can kill two birds with one stone and bring back samantha from the grave with the <laughs> computer board that basically gave bb artificial intelligence so i'm gonna sneak into the morgue with my maybe homoerotic buddy who knows and we're gonna bring her back to life and she comes back to life and starts murdering people <laughs> i think you're missing out something really critical here and that is the fact that BB was going to try to kill that one woman before yes. he got blown up. Right, that's a good point. So that BB is the one who has the murderous instinct as opposed to Samantha. Mm-hmm. When they combine, it's two great tastes that murder together. BB tries to kill a dude in the opening scene of the movie. I mean, right? He, yeah, yeah. He's, a mur- that- he's a murderous ass little shit. This movie's fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I just, but I love the idea that you take a little like hard drive or whatever you want to call it out of fucking BB's brain or was BB's brain and you put it in hers and all of a sudden she's got fucking super strength and just all this crazy shit like how how does this happen it's the dumb thing (laughs) Uh, you know what movie this almost kind of reminded me of it reminded me of making contact have you guys ever heard of that I've not heard of this Okay, it is from Roland Emmerich, and it was made in 1985. It's a weird little thing because it does start off as like this really awesome Spielbergian teenage fantasy thing, but it's also kind of like messed up in a lot of ways. That would have been one of his German films then, right? Before yes, he it came stateside. But it's also, like, shot completely in English. But, yeah, it is technically a German film. Oh, it's our it's our favorite kind of genre of film, which is foreign filmmaker tries to make Hollywood movie the American way. <laughs> we love that so much here at Double Edge Devil Bill. But, uh, I mean, with this movie, partially the, the issue with, like, some of the tonal stuff 
was very much a case of studio meddling where like Wes Craven originally, and he said this many times that like he always felt kind of shoehorned into the horror genre and just never got a chance to really break out aside from like music of the heart, basically. Uh, otherwise he was, you know, confined to the horror genre because he was Nightmare on Elm Street guy and the Scream guy and Last House on the Left even was his first movie and that made such a big splash. So he was trying to make something more in the vein of like a Starman is what he originally wanted to do with this, which would be more a bit like a sci-fi thriller as opposed to the horror movie it kind of became because the studio demanded, hey, uh, test audiences didn't like your like movie that you were going to make. So you need to add a bunch of like nightmare sequences and horror sequences and all this other stuff that... I mean, they don't fit, obviously, in here, but even then, I will say, if you removed all, like, the more overt horror sequences from this movie, I still don't think it would really work. I think it's more fascinating with those horror things in there, but I just, it definitely feels like him trying to stretch himself out a bit in a way that I don't know if it would have even worked for him if he got his own directorial vision. Yeah, I agree. Even as, I I would say that it gets more interesting and funny once those horror elements are added into it because the way bb dies is so over the top and completely unnecessary that um i just couldn't help but laugh i'm sorry i don't know if that makes me a bad person because of like his cries of agony but it was just very The visual of it was very funny to me. We should mention also his voice is Charles Fleischer, who most people would probably know from, like, the voice of Who Framed Roger Rabbit himself. Um, The voice that he does is this weird mix between just, like, a BB, like, he makes these little, like, electronic noises, but also he'll do Roger Rabbit things like the please, like, he does that in a weird electronic way. And imagine that voice dying horribly as Anne Ramsey shoots him with a shotgun multiple times. The three kids, the three main kids, they're like in the bushes as well. And Paul is just absolutely crushed. It, it's like similar to like Batman seeing his parents get shot. Maybe it's just me and I'm not really cognizant, but I just thought it was very funny and very over the top. And if it was anything other than that, I probably would have been kind of bored with the film as a oh. whole. Yeah, yeah, hundred. No, 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 hundred percent. It is that over the topness and the the crazy death of BB and the basketball scene and her weird claw hands that she decides to do when she's running it. People are coming towards them. She got like uh, eye shadow on, so you know she's crazy now. It's just it, it it is those things that make this movie watchable. If it wasn't for that, if this was a straight up like science fiction tale or even a straight up horror movie, it would not work. It's the combination of the two so half-heartedly, maybe not half-heartedly done, but forcibly shoehorned together that make this movie what it is. Otherwise, this movie would be unbearable. But as it sits, it's just kind of like a question mark of what the fuckness. Like, how is this a thing? And why is it this entertaining? Like, it has no reason to be. But yet, here we are. <laughs> and the world That's... is so much better because of it. Let me tell you that. Yeah. Yes. I Very love true. their wrestling match that the, that the two leads have on the floor that's clearly sped up, by the way. And then he just <laughs> punches him in the fucking nose. And the vodka, you can, your son is a crazy man. You know what I'm talking about. Points up the stairs. Like, oh, and oh, then, boy. She, then he almost immediately faints. Yup, but then she <laughs> right. dives out the window. That's my favorite like, thing of the whole movie is her diving out yep. that window and onto him. And Beat his head against the fucking ground. Yes. I, I just shout out to like Christy Swanson, who like this whole movie is if like it is she's just like, oh, I'm the sweet girl next door. Then she dies and comes back and she's trying to be menacing. But with the weird thing, like as I mentioned, like she's moved her fingers into like what looks like the live long and prosper symbol from Star Trek, but also trying to imitate the claws of BB. And she's trying to be like a robot who's like confused or whatever, but she's just doing like C-3PO hands which are the arms, which I love. She's like, oh my word, I am BB human cyborg relations. <laughs> it's so fucking funny that like you can tell she's like very earnest in trying to do it, but God, she's so bad at it. It's so fucking funny. <laughs> she honestly gives the most committed performance of that entire movie because you could tell that she trained extensively for all that choreography. And by all that choreography, I just mean like her walking and where she was placing her arms. 
best acting in the movie to me is when Paul comes back with the dry cleaning. He realizes something's going on. And the mom asks him twice if he got the bread. And there's a real long pause, man. It's so <laughs> dramatic. What? Bread, your bread. I forgot that. Sorry. And she looks at it like, <laughs> you youngster. It's like, well, you know, the, the sleeping bag, but I bought you a $200 sleeping bag. When you're working at IBM and you can afford all the sleeping bags you want, then you can do what you want with them. Now, wait a minute. What kind of faith do you have in your son that he wants to be, like he wants to be rich and famous so he can have that tight ass sleeping bag money? Like what? What is the lesson you're trying to teach here? It's, you use your sleeping bag outside? <gasps> How dare you? <laughs> well, I had to test it to make sure it worked, Ma. Yuck! It's like this kid's a genius. This kid's a genius. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sure. Well, somebody burned his face off and. They say old well, Miss whatever the fuck her name was. Hey, she had bits of her head all around. And then the kid, whoa, it passes out. It's so good. And I love the fact that the cop, she's crazy. He's, yeah, I'll tell her, I'll get there when I do. And he's got this sandwich with entirely too much meat in it. Like there is so much meat hanging out of that fucking sandwich. <laughs> like, what do you, who are you people? Like, where, huh? That's what I love is that like it, it, in like the same in a similar but very different way to like people under the stairs where every corner of that house has a new detail you're fascinated by. Every person in Deadly Friend just has a weird vibe that you're just like, what the who the fuck are you? Are you a human? What is they this? drug the mom? Yes, and then and then the buddy's like, I think he killed her. <laughs> He's like, huh, mom, mom, and she wakes up. I slept here all night. Oh, no, better get to my business. Like, wouldn't you first of all be like, all right, who the fuck drugged me? Like, so, like honestly, like, what the fuck happened here? I drank, like, three cups of coffee last night. I don't know why I would fall that conk out of sleep. For 17 hours on this uncomfortable-ass <laughs> wood-lined couch. Like, what the fuck? The funniest thing about that, too, is that they didn't even have to drug her. Because she just comes out and says, you should probably be there for when they take her off life support. So, right. like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they could have just gone with no permission. But, she would have drove them. <laughs> <laughs> nah, they had to take their bikes. Well, I, I also love when they go back over there, and after they've stolen the ambulance and all this other stuff, Paul and Tom are just like, "Oh, we're gonna put it inside." And her leg clearly moves at a certain point, and he's like, "Tom, look, he's let no, she can't be." And then like she has to like eject her leg out of the fucking bedroom. You're like, "Whoa, what?" Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, she's brain dead. She's dead, man. It's not gonna work. We can still save her. All right. <laughs> the fuck? I like the fact that uh, this kid, he doesn't know that like the body can still twitch after death. So he's just very convinced that there's absolutely no way she can she can move, whether like she has the chip inside of her or not. I there's just so much to this movie and oh, it's science. <laughs> I love being thrown into a windshield that doesn't break and you don't go through it. You just sort of land out of it instantly death. Like, oh, instantly yes. the, death. the bully, which I, I love the fact that the bully's introduced like 15 minutes in when yep. he first moves in and gets his balls crushed by BB. And he's like, I'll get you. And then it takes an hour and then he comes back. just like, Oh, you remember this character? <laughs> And sees Christy Swanson and is just like, oh, I thought you were dead. He's very casual about the fact of like, oh, hey, girl, I thought you were dead. Oh, shit, what's up? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and then he, she gets, she throws that motherfucker <laughs> just several feet. <laughs> yeah, the cop's like, hey, must, she must have thrown him 30 feet. Well, no, it was clearly like six because we saw the perspective. But yeah, all right, whatever. Go have some more fucking corned beef, you asshole. This is all your fault. <laughs> they were not showing up earlier. Had to have that Reuben. Yeah, fucking prick. Oh, I, I I also want to shout out Richard Marcus, who plays the abusive dad, in terms of like the acting oh. on him in oh, certain no. sequences. Like one, there's the dream sequence 
where he's just like gets stabbed and he's like laughing hysterically at that. And he's then, just Freddy Krueger. He's, he's basically he's literally Fred, yeah, just he's, Freddy Krueger. There's also the dream scenes where he shows up in fucking Paul's bed as a severed head, just like ha ha ha, and all this other shit. There's that, but my favorite is like after he has killed his daughter and the ambulance comes in, his response amongst witnesses is just, uh, "She should have watched the stairs." Like, what the? What are you talking about? I told that damn kid to get her toys off the stairs. Toys? This is a 16 year old woman. <laughs> What'd she leave? Like one of those shitty roller skates you strap onto your own tennis shoe? Like she had that still on the stairs? Like what, is, what toys? Get the fuck out of here with this. <laughs> These damn kids and their iPads on the stairs? Their fucking cabbage, cabbage patches and hula hoops. And... <laughs> I love how like unconvincing he is throughout the entire movie. I'm sorry, but he kind of, he has the essence of a badly written Stephen King dad. Feels like someone that is out with you, like if you're out and about, and you can tell they don't really want to be there. So any minor inconvenience, they're like, "Yeah, we should probably just go home then, huh?" Like, <laughs> feels like that, yes. but it's about like pulling his daughter off life support. Right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, uh, we should probably pack it in. Huh? He just left her room with She's feeling gone. no remorse no. whatsoever, and just also that no one is suspicious. That's what I say. Nobody's gonna be like, maybe this fucking guy did something. Because even the doctor's like, looks more like more than a fall to me. Hey, we should probably just take her off life support, huh? Well, you are her, you are her father, so uh, all right. Oh, he's gone. All right. Well, uh. and even when like he gets murdered, his death scene where like he knows like, hey, I think the furnace is on. And he goes downstairs and he sees his daughter. He's just more a bit surprised, just like, oh shit, how are you here? As opposed to Sam, what the like, fuck? Horrifying. What the fuck, Sam? <laughs> I just saw you an hour ago. I killed you. What the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> okay, not to de- not to defend an aspect of this movie, but we did see that he was a very frequent drunk. So I'm just saying maybe he thought he was hallucinating. Hold on here. All right. I drink a lot. I, I, it's one of my favorite things. All right. <laughs> I've, I, I, I've, I've, you know, been soused several times in my life. I've, if, if I saw a dead relative, not even my sister, which that would be really crazy because I haven't seen her in years. But if I saw Aww. a dead relative just walk in my house, I'd be like, oh, fuck, what's up? I'd be like, <laughs> oh, my God. No, no. There's no way it's a hallucination. I would not, like, no way. <laughs> like, well, if even, if it was a, even if it was a hallucination, you would be also mortified by it. Oh, good lord. You know, as Aaron mentioned, there's so much to talk about with Deadly Friend. I'm curious, Aaron, do you have any other details we haven't mentioned that you want to mention before we go into, like, final thoughts and everything? Um, I think I've, I think I've said my piece. This was an experience, for sure. But at the end of the day, it was fun, it was goofy, it was funny, and that in and of itself is so much better than uh, having it just be boring. Because of funny bad movie to me is always so much better than just a bad movie kudos to you wes yeah i mean th- that's the thing is that we love a good bad movie on this show we love talking about very unintentionally funny movies and he's definitely made a lot worse we can mm-hmm. definitely say he's made so much less watchable uninteresting bad movies that deadly friend is just fascinating because of like all the production stuff all the other like the weird tonal shifts like he has had tonal shift problems in some of his worst movies this is like it's you will ha- get like whiplash that breaks your neck watching this fucking movie in terms of just like wait what wait what <laughs> wait what you do you will do that like every five or six minutes with deadly friend and it's 90 minutes i'm just impressed like wow you packed this much crazy shit into such a short package i'm astonished all the way to the ending one, the ending dr- sort of dream, or maybe it's a reality sequence where BB kind of mutates and bursts out of Sam's body, leading into the BB song during the end credits, which, God, I love that fucking terrible BB song <laughs> so much. I made this my letterbox log for this stupid movie, but I'm just going to start spreading the rumor that the director of Tetsuo the Iron Man was inspired by that ending. I'm just going to, I'm gonna, I'm not going to source anything i'm not gonna like bring any citations i'm just gonna start saying it and hope people believe me 
I mean, just write a film credit article about it, and everyone be like, oh, yes, of course, that makes so much sense. The, yes. <laughs> the artistic influence of Wesker. Yes, of course. <laughs> it'll be cited as a source on Wikipedia for sure. Uh, but I guess you and I have pretty much done our final thoughts. Aaron, Adam, do you have any final thoughts on Deadly Friend? I just love the fact that fucking Mama from Film Mama at the Train and Mama from Goonies gets her head obliterated by like a straight layup pass. And it is the worst headless dummy i think i've like ever seen um to where it's like bouncing around arms are dead ass straight but there's so much activity going on in the midsection like it's ridiculous you can tell it's like some intern is like crouched down moving like on a rod that puppet with (laughs) gorgeous legs that's not her legs or maybe it is i have no idea but no it's 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 amazing in its ridiculousness it's it's just so fun like I said, a real level of how the fuck did this happen? If you haven't seen it, it's, like you said, it's a gem. It's one of those so bad it's good. Yes. Uh, point being, Ann Ramsey never skipped a link day. Um, but it's time we did our uh, weekly segment that we do uh, near the end of the show, The Double Redo, where uh, Adam and I each uh, have, uh, and a guest like Aaron, also can participate if they would like to, uh, we basically program the best and worst possible a double feature related to whatever topic we're doing so uh each of us has four movies uh that are from the horror master Wes craven uh that we'll be uh, talking about here to recommend and maybe not recommend a couple movies so uh, i'm gonna go ahead and start with mine uh here i'll be a bit brief i guess uh, i have my two good ones are kind of hot takes i guess because i've seen some very divisive reaction to both these movies but i saw them in prep for this episode Uh, because they were blind spots for me, and I had a lot of fun with both of them. The first one I have from 1989 is Shocker, which, if you don't know, is the the premise involves uh, this kid who has the psychic ability to see this uh, one particular uh, killer that's going around murdering people, and he ends up helping to catch this murderer who had murdered his uh, foster mother and foster siblings. And uh, that killer played by Mitch Pileggi ends up getting uh, shocked to death right before he d- though he does this like big elaborate ritual in front of a television that basically makes it so when he ends up getting uh, executed he is able to teleport through electricity including through televisions and telephones and all these other things and seeks his revenge and to murder more people as the movie goes along it's another bug nuts one in a similar vein to Deadly Friend but I think this one has a bit more of like A stream of consciousness just like, oh my god, we're just introducing all sorts of crazy new things as it goes along. There's a ghost involved of one of the people who was like one of his victims. There's a whole sequence where him and the main kid fight through different television channels after they both get sucked into the TV. It's bonkers, but in a way that I find to be a lot of fun and displays a lot of like Craven's weird, interesting predilections about like okay how about uh, we cover like the horrible atrocities of a man who could murder innocent people but also <laughs> jumps into a tv <laughs> and they fight throughout different old classic movies and war movies and all this other bullshit it's so weird so fun and then the other one i have is a more recent movie he did from 2005 i have red eye which is a pretty simple story uh, where rachel mcadams plays a woman who runs a hotel who is going over to uh the funeral of her grandmother and catches a red eye flight where she sits next to a seemingly very charming man played by uh, Killian Murphy, uh, who, as it turns out, is plotting an assassination attempt for a key political figure who is at R- Rachel McAdams's hotel who's staying there. They're trapped on the plane together and she has to try and call to get his room moved and all this other stuff. There's a lot of tension that's there. And I think it's just kind of like an entertainment I miss where it's just like, okay, hey, it's a small compact thriller with two very attractive and very interesting actors who are playing cat and mouse with each other that ends up with like a big explosive climax. And I mean that very clearly. There's, there's a lot of that fun. That's there where there's a bit of the restraint for Wes Craven throughout most of the movie. And then it gets bonkers once again, by the ending and it's all within an 85 minute package. It's perfect. I miss movies like this that were short, sweet and to the point and it was clearly kind of a paycheck for Craven, but one that he took very seriously. I think it's one of his more enjoyable, fun little movies. And the performances from McAdams, and particularly uh, Killian Murphy, are so fun together. I, I, it's a great showcase for both of them as well. And then my two bad, um, one of them I think is definitely a hot take, because this is sort of the movie that put him on the map. 
But uh, I have his first film, Last House on the Left, which was very influential at the time, uh, but is this, you know, rape revenge movie. I'm not a fan of that genre. And I think it's very amateurish in a way that really shows off with, like, the tonal whiplashes, I think, are much more distressing in that movie where horrible things happen uh, that involve, like, this, these killers tracking down this, like, young girl. And within, like, moments after horrible, awful, disturbing things happen, there's, like, bumbling cop bullshit from, like, Smokey and the Bandit that just shows up to... I get the implication is, oh, we're contrasting all the horrible stuff that happens with the ineptitude that's here. It's like it's discordant. It's supposed to, like, unnerve you. But it just really is more of an upsetting watch that doesn't do much for me, that doesn't really invest me or terrify me or make me really think and contemplate the horrors of our world. It's just, it's the virgin spring, but with stupid, awful comedic relief, followed by even more exploitative and just poorly filmed horror sequences that I'm just not a fan of, never have been. I tried to give another chance here after watching it ages ago, and I'm just like, no... Um, and then I have The Hills Have Eyes Part 2, which Wes Craven, obviously another big one that came out for him in the 70s was Hills Have Eyes, which I'm not even as huge a fan of either the original Hills Have Eyes. I think it's a much better movie than Last House on the Left, but I still think it has a lot of similar problems. And at a certain point in the 80s, uh, right before Nightmare on Elm Street, but it came out a bit after, um, he was really desperate for money. So he finally accepted the offer to make a sequel. This was like in 1983 he was making it, so several years after the original came out in 77. And it's basically turning what was a sort of Texas Chainsaw, like more grounded, grimy, upsetting horror movie into a slasher of the era. It's very much like oh, a bunch of people go out into the middle of the same desert where the previous events of the first film happened and they get picked off one by one. It's very cliche. And also they ran out of money when they shot in 1983, so they couldn't, like, film the whole thing. And then by the time A Nightmare on Elm Street came out, they were like, oh, shit, we have to, like, let's put this out immediately. So it came out, like, in 1985. And to pack it up to, like, feature length, I think it's about 85 minutes as well, they insert a bunch of flashbacks from the original movie. Like, I would say 40% of Hills Have Eyes Part 2 is just Hills Have Eyes Part 1, down to the dog from the first movie comes back, and the dog has a flashback. That literally happens in this fucking movie. They cut to the dog, who's just like, rrr, rrr, and then they do the fucking fade flash, and it shows him attacking Michael Berryman in the first movie, the same footage. It's so dumb. It's so bad. I would say it's his worst movie. Uh, but yeah, those are my picks. I love Shocker for its absurdity. It is absolutely mind-blowingly like, just wild. Uh, and you forgot to mention that the high schooler is played by Peter Berg, uh, yes. you know, big time director now, but you know, and there's no way he's a high schooler. No, like I mean, he's got a deeper voice than I do. Like, hey, Piccoli, hey, Piccoli, yeah. and you're like, what the fuck? What is happening here? But it's great. It's so great. Mitch Pelegi is hamming it up. He's on level 14 compared to everybody else. He's so good in it. I think it gets too much guff for being cheesy or whatever, uh, but it's great. Uh, Red Eye, I like the first two thirds of it. I think it's a real taut thriller. Um, I think Rachel Adams and Killian Murphy are really good together. Uh, I think he gives one of the, you know, a really good villain performance that really doesn't get any attention. And it's kind of a shame because he's really good. And then it just goes crazy. And then, I mean, there's rocket launchers and there's all this other wacky shit, tracheotomies and whatever else. You're like, what the fuck is happening? But yeah, I, I agree with you. At a tight 88 minutes, it's 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 great. Like, we do not get that anymore. And I, I really do wish we did. Excuse me, 85. You cut three of those minutes off, sir. He doesn't even need those three extra minutes. <laughs> I love the credits start at like minute 77. It Hell was yeah. beautiful. <laughs> And uh, real quickly, getting your bad, I agree with Last House. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the rape prevention uh, sort of genre. I get its importance. I get what it did for the genre as a whole. I understand how groundbreaking it was and all that stuff and how it brought Wes Craven into the mainstream in a way and definitely gave him uh, a boost. Um, so I appreciate it for that, but I, it's just, it, it's so totally all over the place. Like, you know, like you said, there's the horrible you know major scene and then they're all cleaning the grass off their fingers and everything and then you all of a sudden you get Yuck! two dumb hillbilly cops and you're like oh, okay well great 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 and then hills have ice too the only reason to watch is for the dog flashback other than that <laughs> like that movie's terrible but if the dog has a flashback that's a cinematic first and probably last it's great 
Um, I definitely agree with Red Eye. There's always something happening in that film. And you really can't look away whether it's because you're feeling tensed out and stressed because you don't know what's going to happen next. And then something just completely absurd happens that um, you just can't look away from. Admittedly, unfortunately, Shocker is another blind spot of mine, but I am absolutely going to be watching it very soon. I promise. I'm like fine with Last House on the Left. I understand that um, it is quite brutal when it's at its most violent. And it's also quite mean spirited, arguably more so than I Spit on Your Grave. It, the way that it's shot, because you could definitely tell it was from a first time filmmaker who had no experience, it didn't really make me feel nervous or tense or scared about what was happening. It just kind of felt like a little more silly, unfortunately. And I know that's kind of uh, bad to say, considering the subject matter of Last House on the Left, but... When it's shot the way that it's shot, I'm sorry, I just can't take it that seriously. It looks more like everyone's flailing around. And as far as Hills Have Eyes Part 2, I saw the first one. I'm good with that. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah, you're pretty good. You've seen at least 40% of Hills yep. Have Eyes Part 2, then you're good. <laughs> um, but Adam, go ahead with your choices, please, for the double redo. All right. So my first pick uh, for the good was actually my alternate pick. Uh, if people on a series wouldn't have chosen, I have Serpent and the Rainbow. It is sort of my first introduction into the world of, you know, even though it's very over dramatized and overblown, and, but, but the first experience I had with like voodoo as a culture and a thing, and um, you know, the idea of voodoo zombies and all that, this was the first time I ever saw anything like that. And, uh, it, it, it scared the shit out of me. It blew me away. Really sort of picked my curiosity to where I went on a huge binge of kind of watching anything I could about voodoo, voodoo zombies. Like I'm talking Sugar Hill and then all the other, the old Karloff zombie movies with the voodoo zombies and all that stuff. I, I just went nuts for it. And then I took like classes about sort of the mythology behind voodoo. And I got a, bought a bunch of books and everything. It just really sort of opened my eyes to this to this other type of culture, be it the Haitian, if you want to call it that, or the New Orleans voodoo, or however you want to look at it. But I, I really, really find it fascinating as a story. I think it's incredibly fucking well acted. I think it's probably my favorite Bill Pullman, like, ever. I, I just think it's a scary, scary, scary movie about the unknown, uh, especially if you look at it through Bill Pullman's eyes. And it's just, it's a fascinating, fascinating movie. Uh, it's based on a true story supposedly i mean i have the book but yeah you know how reliable is the narrator and then my other one i have which is uh wes craven's first sort of really meta movie before scream which really should have been the end technically still is unless you count the remake of the nightmare on elm street franchise uh wes craven's new nightmare um, I think it's fucking fantastic. I think it's terrifying. We've talked about it on the show here before, uh, so I won't go too far into it, but I love the redesign of Freddy. I love the idea of the Alice in Wonderland aspect to it and all that stuff. I love the returning cast. I love John Saxon and his hairpiece. Uh, Miko Hughes, nah. <laughs> but other than that, I think it's a great, great movie. Uh, super fun. Uh, scary as shit, like scary as Freddy is actually terrifying again. Like he's not cracking wise really or anything like that. He's just a horrible, horrible demon killer. Um, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And Wes Craven in his bit part, really good. Bob Shea, no, but Wes Craven, really good. Um, and for my bad, uh, at first I have Scream 3. It feels so studio mandated to me to where we got to get bigger. We got to get bigger. We got to get bigger. And they just went off the fucking rails with this movie. I mean, the the technology behind the voice changer, he, he's her half brother. Her mom was a Hollywood starlet before she moved to this small town. Uh, but she was like passed around by Lance Henriksen. And it was like basically Roger Corman. So over the top and so far away from what the first one was. Uh, it's just, and even from the second one, really, it's just, it's so outrageous and dumb and overblown and populated by a cast of just unlikable people. I, I just think it's a huge, huge misstep. Thank God Scream 4 was good. Um, 
but yeah, Scream 3, nope. And then quickly, because I've only seen it once, but I remember thinking it was terrible and boring, is uh, My Soul to Take. I've seen the concept done before. I've seen the idea sort of done before. Identity, things like that have, have sort of played with this idea that they do in this. And uh, it, it just doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. It's it's Wes Craven. It feels like it's it's really neutered horror, which I believe it was. I believe it was originally R, but then it was got cut back to PG-13. And you could really feel the cuts in this movie. Not a bad cast. Everyone's trying, at least, for the most part. It feels like every take every cut, every edit is missing another five seconds. And the sort of movie feels like you're playing catch up the whole time to see what's going to happen, even though you kind of know from the beginning. It's not a very well uh, kept secret. Uh, And it was kind of a bummer because it's one of his later movies and uh, just ultimately is a huge failure. Um, Yeah, I mean, I dig um, those choices. I think those are um, pretty accurate, at least from what I've seen. I have not seen My Soul to Take. That's the one I haven't seen. I'd heard pretty infamously bad things about that. But Scream 3, we talked about elsewhere. And I agree that I think it's the worst of that franchise. I don't think it's, like, completely unredeemable, though. I think there's a couple things, particularly. Parker Posey is so fucking funny in that movie. Mm -hmm. She's so good. She's, like, such an entertaining presence. And I like some of the thematics they're doing with, like, you mentioned the whole, um, like, uh, Sydney's uh, mother attempted to be a Hollywood star and then just kind of got screwed over by horrible, like, sexist piece of shit, the producer Lance Hendrickson. I think that's a lot more interesting and incisive and people give it credit for, especially given this was a movie produced, a whole franchise produced by Harvey Weinstein, um, you know, several decades before he ended up being revealed to be the piece of shit that he was. Um, and I think that element is enough to make it at least fascinating, I, even though I do agree, I think it's very uneven, and I think that it's a lot to, like, it was so rewritten, like, on the fly, all this other stuff. Like, Scream 2 even suffered from that, but this movie was even more just like we can't risk any like script leaks that happened on the last movie so we're just going to rewrite pages on the day and stuff like that it suffers from that you can clearly tell but i still don't think it's like irredeemable and not nearly one of his worst movies for sure but um new nightmare we've talked about like you said i dig that one quite a bit i would say the three nightmare and elstree movies that are worth watching are the ones that craven was involved with with the first one and this one that he directed and wrote and then he was at least partially responsible for writing the third one dream warriors and those are the sort of three essential ones I'd recommend anybody see to that degree. Because it kind of tells the story of Freddy both as a literal character, but also his kind of like cultural impact. And how, especially with New Nightmare, one of the more interesting meta-contextual movies. I'll say, if you like Matrix Resurrections, maybe give New Nightmare a chance. Um, and then Serpent in the Rainbow, I dig quite a bit as well. I think that's the best, least dramatic Bill Pullman performance. Um, and even though, admittingly, it's dealing, as you mentioned, with like the sort of voodoo stereotype um i can at least say it doesn't feel as negative as it could be but maybe not the best expert on that at the same time and it still has a lot of like really horrifying scenes particularly when bill pullman is saying like i'm not dead and they put him in the coffin uh that is deeply upsetting (laughs) on so many levels Um, i don't know aaron do you have any thoughts on this I got pretty much all the same thoughts as you. I will say, though, that I get what they were trying to do with Scream 3 because it was such a Hollywood-centric story. And so some of, like, the more dramatic stuff, like the house blowing up, that I know that was very goofy, but I get what they're going for because it's all big now. It's all, they're in Hollywood. And I also, I'm sorry, I kind of like the voice changer, I know that's an unpopular opinion, but I do think that adds, like, even though it's completely unrealistic and absolutely cannot happen in real life, I kind of like the fact that it adds the mystery to who Ghostface is, because Ghostface can be anybody. I liked The Serpent in the Rainbow. I love, absolutely love New Nightmare. It's what, probably my favorite Nightmare on Elm Street film. And I just thought my soul to take was boring and also had some of the most egregiously shot 3D scenes I've seen of that era. Like they were trying to make that 3D so badly. You know, and, and real quick, uh, I do want to add to you to the screen three discussion. I absolutely agree. Parker Posey is fucking killing in that movie. Uh, she's great. And I also really like Patrick Warburton in that movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the bit where she jumps into Patrick Warburton's arms is like the moment of the movie. Hey there, Dewdrop. <laughs> he calls him Dewdrop constantly. <laughs> yes. He's like, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> for sure. But uh, Aaron, you had some choices as well. Yes. So my first one is actually, I didn't realize it was my first Wes Craven movie I've ever seen until years after. And this one is Vampire in Brooklyn. I remember seeing this on like AMC or some other channel that was just on when I was younger. And I thought it was really cool because I had always thought of vampires as like these scary creatures. I, I used to be such a wimp as a kid. So it's really funny to see me grow up to be someone who's like so into horror. But Vampire in Brooklyn make me realize that, hey, like, even though these are like monsters, they're not always scary. That one thing kind of helped me change my entire perception about horror. And that made me interested in horror years before I even realized it was a Wes Craven movie. Eddie Murphy, of course, he does great in the roles that he is in. But I do think that the MVP here is Angela Bassett, of course, as Rita. I just thought that she was a very strong character. Second one might be an unpopular opinion, depending on the crowds that listen to this podcast. But my second for the good section is Swamp Thing. I know that it is far and away not the most accurate of DC adaptations, but I just think it's fun. It's of that time period where all you really wanted to do is just see people in costumes just beat up other people and there's none of this like massive lore it really harkens back to the time period where superhero movies weren't bound by sequels because the first Swamp Thing really is a standalone from the sequel and the tv series that came after it you could just watch this one Swamp Thing movie and understand it perfectly and not have to watch the others I do think I that it is very much representative of that growth period that Wes Craven was in between his more gritty works, such as Hills Have Eyes and Last House on the Left, and his more refined stuff, because it looks similar to Last House on the Left, not only in the uh, locations, but also just the frantic way that it's shot. I just think that it's good, goofy fun, and that final boss monkey dog thing (laughs) that Swamp Thing battles at the end. I mean, sure, sure. So with this, I am going to go on the other end of the spectrum with his kind of transitional period and say that my next film in the bad section is Deadly Blessing. And It's just mostly because I just thought it was boring. There's not really much here. I didn't care for any of the acting in it. And it just, honestly, what it reminded me of was a horror version of Witness. I can't even really recall the plot of the story that much, other than the fact that it is probably his most hardcore stance against organized religion. That's all I can really remember of it. And so my last one, Music of the Heart. And it's not just because it's not a horror movie. Let me just get that clear. One of my least favorite types of movies is that really weird subgenre that popped up in the late 90s, early 2000s, where a well-off white teacher goes to a lower-class neighborhood and suddenly changes the entire school system essentially and helps change these kids lives there's some real weird white savior stuff within that subgenre, like freedom writers for example and music of the heart is just kind of a pretty egregious example of that and it seems like every other similar movie of that time period there's none of that distinctive Wes Craven flair that all of his other movies have It would be like a movie like The People Under the Stairs or Vampire in Brooklyn, where you may not realize it was by Wes Craven, but you could still tell that it was made by Wes Craven. With Music of the Heart, it just seems so basic and weird and uh, 
probably hit my least favorite film of his, honestly, just because of how milk toast it is. Uh, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen Deadly Blessing, um, but I have seen the other ones. In fact, we covered both of your good picks previously on the show. Uh, with Swamp Thing, I agree. It's so fun, especially it's just like an early superhero movie where, like, just the context of the fact that this was only after, like, the other DC adaptations, the only other major ones were the first two Superman movies before it like it, it feels like it's so interesting like a time capsule of like we're trying to translate this to film it has a lot of problems but at the same time there's mm-hmm. a charm that's going on there um and the suit looks interesting even if it especially they they shoot it too much during the day and it's very cool oh, like, you should not put, show that in full sunlight but there's there's a lot of interesting stuff and you can tell it, kind of, it works for craven's like horror sensibilities a lot and then Vampire in Brooklyn, we did actually as a bad pick for Angela Bassett, but I think it's not nearly as bad as, like, it might have been around that time, especially with, like, that was during a bad period for Eddie Murphy's career. It's not nearly his worst movie of that time. Um, And Mm -hmm. you can tell, like, he's a bit more checked out during the comedy stuff, but he really wanted to be not a comedy star at that point, wanted to do something more in the vein of, like, a horror, almost kind of like a William Marshall from Blackula performance, and when he's doing that, he works phenomenally. Mm-hmm. And I agree that Bast's very good. Also, Jonathan Witherspoon, of course, always a highlight in any of his movies. A very fun, comedic relief character. And Music of the Heart, interestingly, I think was the first Wes Craven movie I ever saw, because my mother dragged me to that when I was a small child in the theater. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't tell you much about the movie itself beyond, like, Meryl Streep and Angela Bassett were also in it, but I can tell you the, all of the lyrics to the music of my heart, the Academy Award-nominated song featuring Gloria Estefan and Sync, uh, because my mother loved that soundtrack, and she loved playing it all the time. I could probably recite the whole lyrics, and I won't do that, because I respect all of you listeners out there. I'm trying to make a good first impression. Do it! Do no. it! Do I am, I am not... I will recommend, though, that music video is pure cheese, and it's so funny to see Gloria Estefan try so hard to make that work while, like, behind her is fucking Joey Fatone with the bad red dye job, and Justin Timberlake in full ramen hair from, like, that early NSYNC era. Oh. Perfect. Um, but I don't know if I'd recommend the film necessarily. Uh, yeah, and to be quick, uh, Vampire Brooklyn, yeah, like Thomas said, it was one of our bad picks. Uh, I still think Bassett's great in it. I think when Eddie Murphy's not going comedic, he's great in it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's one of those that I'm not a huge fan of, but every time it's on, I'll watch it. For some reason, that movie just has some charm to it. I don't know if it's because it's Wes Craven or what it is, or it's so different. Uh, but I, I will definitely watch it. And Swamp Thing, I, I love. Uh, it's just... One of my prized possessions, I have a signed Adrian Barbeau Swamp Thing poster. Um, I absolutely love Swamp Thing. It's I loved everything I could get my hands on with Swamp Thing. I watched the cartoon show. I watched the television show. I watched second movie. I had the toys. I love Swamp Thing. I don't have them anymore. I'm not like uh, fucking Sam at 16 with a bunch of Swamp Thing toys on my stairs. Um, <laughs> you don't want to trip on the stairs. Good point. Yeah, I don't want to trip, trip on my Swamp Thing toys. Um <laughs> Uh, Deadly Blessing, I've seen once, just like you, and I'd be hard-pressed to tell you anything about it. It's so ultimately forgettable to me. Um, and uh, Music of the Heart, yeah, I, I completely agree with what you said, Aaron. It, it's one of those white savior movies. It's like Mr. Holland's opus, the double X chromosome. It's it's cookie-cutter bullshit. You've seen it a hundred times. Uh, there's no flair behind it, really. You could tell it's Wes Craven, like, trying to say show, which in a way I, I applaud him for it, but showing, like, I can do other things. And I just ultimately, it's a failure to me. It, it's just, it's a bore fest. But uh, as we end the segment, we like to just repeat the titles in case anybody might have missed them. So I'll start and we'll go in the same order we went. Um, I'll just say my uh, two good were Shocker and Red Eye. And then my two bad were the original Last House on the Left and the original Hills Have Eyes Part 2. And my good were Serpent of the Rainbow and New Nightmare. And my bad were Scream 3 and My Soul to Take. And my good were Vampire in Brooklyn and Swamp Thing. And my bad were Deadly Blessing and Music of the Heart. Yes, and uh, thank you all for listening to that. And we also have some other people to thank as we head on out of here. Uh, first, we want to thank Chris Oliver for intro and outro music for the show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. 
Thanks to Christian Thor Lally for our artwork. Uh, follow him at Night of Water. That's night with a K underscore of underscore water uh, for more of his great stuff. We also want to thank, of course, our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash DEDBpod, where for just $1 a month, you get to listen to bonus podcasts we do, like On the Edge of Relevance, where we cover new movies uh, that have come out in theaters or in streaming. Uh, we'll be doing one for Scream soon, the new Scream. So uh, you'll definitely be able to hear that. And you also get to vote for like movies we cover or topics. Topics we do all sorts of stuff like that uh, over there for just the one dollar. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned, by the way, for our picking, which we'll be doing at the very end of this episode for next week's episode. Uh, but before we do that, we uh, we want to thank Aaron, of course. Aaron, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Please plug yourself. Where can people find you out there on the internet? Well, thank you guys very much. It was certainly an honor to be here, and I hope you do it again. I don't really have anything special. To plug unfortunately but you can i guess you can find me on twitter at aaron martina i post way too much on there and it's mostly shit posts so thank you very much again for having me oh a pleasure to have you on but um if you want to follow us in our rinky dink operation uh you can find us on twitter and facebook at dedb pod and uh, also you can submit feedback to us double edge double bill at gmail.com all spelled out and uh, for more of my antics, uh, where I do shit posts uh, as well as sincere things that are way worse than the shit posts, uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as at not the who's Tommy. I also do some writing at both uh, MarianiThomas.wordpress.com and over at Film-Cred.com. And I'm on Twitter or Instagram at Atom or Adam. That's A T O M underscore O R underscore A D A M. And I'm also on Letterbox at Schwanson. That's S C H W A N D T S O N. And uh, for more of us, please uh, subscribe or follow whichever the new modern term is uh, over on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcasting platforms. And uh, if you're listening on Talk Film Society and maybe are a bit new and are more from our audience, uh, go ahead and listen to all the other great shows that are on there. I'm a patron. It's a really uh, fun podcast network with a lot of great shows on there, like Sequels. We've had folks from Sequels on the show shout out, like Sarah Sorrentino and Shaquille and Alejandra. We've had them on, and that's a great show. But there's all sorts of other great ones on there as well. And uh, you can also dig into our Podbean main feed uh, for all the 190 episodes we did before we joined uh, this particular show. There's so many hours of content of me and Adam and guests splathering about oh. movies. So many. <laughs> so many hours. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, if you can't support us on the Patreon, that's totally cool. The completely free way to help us out is to rate, review, or simply share the show around because that gets some more visibility out there. Yeah, hey, Christian. Since we uh, switch networks and stuff, doesn't mean you can fucking take a day off. All right, buddy? Like, just just keep just keep soldiering on for us. Yep. Christian Alvarez, previous guest, friend of the show, and person who shares well, around quite well, frequently. Well, <laughs> previous guest, I'll agree with. <laughs> previous. <laughs> no future guest, I guess. Who knows? Uh, but Ouch. <laughs> well, now, Adam, it's time we did our picking for next week. Because, uh, you know, every week, Adam and I have to pick the movies we do for the next week's episode. So, in this case, uh, we switch up on the quality of good and bad. So, I have the two good picks for next week's episode. And Adam has the two bad picks for that particular episode. And uh, we've each assigned number between 1 and 10 for our choices. And uh, we randomly uh, sort of put a number between 1 and 10 onto both of those. And uh, either... The other person who doesn't have the picks that are being chosen, or the guest, in this case Aaron, will pick a number between 1 and 10 for those choices, whatever that's closest to between the two picks. That gets us our good and our bad feature. Though keep in mind, we also have this rule that we've instituted uh, called the Godfather rule, where both Adam and I were given a veto for our anniversary last May. And uh, that veto basically means that if, say, Adam says one of the bad choices... And uh, I say, like, you know what? I don't want to cover that. Actually, I'm going to take the cannoli, Adam, unless that choice gets obliterated. I still have that veto in my back pocket. Uh, Adam chose to use his a few episodes ago when we did our 2021 wrap-up episode, which led to us not watching the, uh, the Amazon Cinderella movie. And instead, we watched Me, You, Madness, which is the movie from the wife of former Secretary of Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin's movie that she wrote, directed, and starred in. That's fascinating. That's a very interesting episode <laughs> when we go into that one from a couple of weeks ago. But for my two good choices for our topic, which, because we're in the middle of January, we're going to release it, 
we're going to be talking about January releases, you know, usually adult month when theaters are more thriving. Uh, we decided, uh, you know, let's go back to this. We've done it previously well in our history. So any movie that was released in January of the last several years or so is up for it. Uh, so I have the two good ones. I has the two bad ones. Please, Aaron, for my two good choices, pick a number between one and ten. Hmm. Let's go with two. Okay. Over at number one, I had um, one of many movies released in January starring this particular man, uh, but I would say this is the best of his sort of old man action movie craze. I have uh, the Liam Neeson starring The Grey, the one with the wolves. Hmm. Hey, guys, do I know something really cool about Liam Neeson? Oh, no. (laughs) Look, I'm aware of that. (laughs) (laughs) Have you guys ever seen the photos of him pissing his pants? Oh, yes, there's that. Okay, yes. That's the more innocent thing. That's true. Yeah, yes, yeah. I've seen that. That's hilarious. I thought, I thought you were going to say how he hangs brain. Uh, anyways, yeah, I have it. I, I love the gray. The gray is a great choice. I love the gray. Criminally underseen. Yes. So um, at the other end, though, I have another, I think, very criminally underseen movie uh, that I would recommend anyway, especially any tall film society people. I think it's a pretty solid movie about movies. Over at number eight, I had Joe Dante's Matinee, which oh, stars great. John Goodman as like a William Castle-style schlockmeister. Very good movie. Oh, very underrated. Very fine choice as well. All right, Aaron. Are you ready? You got to pick a number mm-hmm. for my bad choices. All right. I'm going to go towards the other end of the spectrum with seven. All right. At number seven on the dot, I oh. have a movie which its cast is sort of phenomenal. Like, it's one of the craziest, best ensemble casts I've ever heard of. Yet, it is considered one of the worst movies ever made. I have the movie 43. Oh. Oh, oh no. I figured. Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> Thomas. Do you want to take the cannoli? This is the most tempted I've ever been to do so. But I'm afraid what's on the other side of this. Um, uh, yeah, you never know. You never know. Well... You know, there's a lot to talk about with movie 43. Uh, um, you know, I'm not going to take the cannoli this time. We're going to... Oh, I we're, tried. We're... <laughs> I fucking tried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, fine. So at number one, I had the Oofy Bowl alone in the dark. Oh, we have so much more to talk about. I'm so glad I didn't do that. <laughs> there would be nothing to talk about with alone yeah, in the dark. <laughs> Oof. Oof. All right, yeah. so, The Grey and Movie 43. That'll be a very interesting episode. That's what you get, folks, if you're new on Talk Film Society. That's how weird our double features get. We'll be talking about that all next time. Uh, but until that next time, thank you for listening, and uh, sweet dreams. Please. Oh, no, BB's back. Yeah, fuck. <laughs>